I had a minor medical procedure done, a cervical biopsy, and the expectation was it would take less than 30 minutes and I'd be home that night and ready to eat dinner and no big deal, but it actually unfolded very differently. After the biopsy, I was put in recovery and I noticed I was bleeding profusely. And I summoned the RN and said, something's gone wrong. And she reassured me three times, despite my protest, that everything was just fine. They sent me home. And once at home, I realized that I was bleeding profusely and it was not getting any better. So I asked my friend who had driven me home to summon an ambulance because I realized given the great quantity of blood and the speed with which I was losing it, that I thought I might be dying. So he summoned an ambulance and they came and took me to an ER that was not far from my home. And at the ER I had a very young doctor and I think she was a bit afraid. She didn't really seem to know what she was doing. And I continued to bleed and they just packed some gauze and left me alone in the room. They'd given me some Dilaudid for pain in an IV and then walked out of the room leaving me alone with my friend. And I lost consciousness soon after that Dilaudid and I was actually unconscious when I died and I woke up at the moment my heart stopped. And my very first thought was, my heart has stopped. And I was literally floating further and further away from my body. And I thought, how do I know my heart has stopped? And I thought, boy, I, I don't know how I know, but I know that's right. And then as I'm continuing to float away from my body, I thought, boy, my whole life I've wondered what it would be like to die, what would take me out. And now it's happened and it was no big deal. And I remember thinking, I wish I'd known what a non-big deal this was and I wouldn't have been so afraid. And one of the thoughts I had as a writer, I thought to myself, wow, I'm dying. And then I said, no, actually, you're not dying, you're dead. And it made me laugh out loud, literally. And I heard myself giggle. And I thought, what exactly did I leave behind on that gurney? I'm giggling, I'm thinking, I can see, I can hear, all my senses are intact. It was very remarkable to realize there really is no death. Not as there no death, but everything we are, even our funny little giggle goes with us. The most remarkable aspect of my near-death experience, and by the way, I call it my temporary death. I wasn't near death. I, was, I had no heartbeat, no blood pressure nothing for more than 10 minutes. So I prefer to think of it as temporary death. But during that time, I, I was impressed beyond words by how much peace and calm I felt. If you could take the most perfect peace a human being could ever imagine and multiply it by a million, I don't think that would touch what I experienced. And that peace was so profound and life-changing. And I remember as I was, again, floating in the darkness, I remember thinking, I should be afraid. I don't like the dark. And I thought, I should be afraid, but I, I have the most perfect peace I've ever known. And that's one of the reasons I had no intention of going back. I, as a writer, as a creative person, I have always suffered from profound anxiety. And subsequent to my husband's tragic death, it seemed like that was multiplied a hundredfold. All that anxiety was gone. And while I was wondering what exactly did I leave behind on that gurney, I realized I left behind the fear, the worries, the anxiety. And I thought, I've always wondered what I would look like when I had no anxiety and no fear and no worries. And I thought, this is great. This is wonderful. So I was floating through that blackness and I thought about the Bible verse, the peace that passeth all understanding. And I thought, this is what Paul was talking about. This is the peace that words could never describe. It passes all the understanding we have as human beings. It was, it was so profound. It, um, it still uh, is very touching to me, that peace I felt. And at one point, um, early on in the experience, shortly after I passed, I thought, I'm having a great time. I'm alone, but I'm having a great time. And um, I remember thinking, I like floating. Floating is fun. This is great. And as a writer, that's horrible. That's horrible text. <laughs> I should have been using bigger words, more expressive language, but that was the best I could do. And I sensed a massive spiritual presence with me, just to my left and slightly behind me. Well, I'm still floating in this blackness and having the time of my life, literally. And I turned my head to the left and a little bit up and I said with a lilt in my voice, and who are you? <laughs> and the answer was immediate. The answer was, you, Rosemary, you are the image and likeness. I'm the original. And I thought, wow. 
And for many years of my life, I've studied Genesis, specifically First Genesis, and that's the language of the Bible from First Genesis 25 and 26 that were made in God's image and likeness. But these words came with an infusion of knowledge. It wasn't mere words. The Bible talks about in the beginning was the word, and I thought about that, that this, this is what that meant. These were words that came with all the power that created the universe. And I thought, wow, could this possibly get any better? <laughs> because now I understand, I'm the image and likeness. And it was, um, it was an experience, I know people say this often, that words can't describe. But I was having such a good time, and I felt honestly, my life has not been an easy one. And I was so grateful that at age 59 it was over, that it almost felt like I'd been granted an early release for good behavior, and now I was on my way back home. And that was a profound feeling, was that I was just going home. And I, I didn't want to go back to Earth at all. It never even crossed my mind about coming back. I just, I literally remember thanking God that I was done, that I had done what I needed to do, and I was now moving home. And at some point, and, and this is still a point of consternation for me, it's almost like somebody took my batteries out. I, there's a complete blank from being in that blackness to being in a white room. And it was a beautiful white room, but it was pure white. The walls, the ceiling, the floor were like luminescent, pearlescent, white, white, white. And I was in this room, and I don't remember the transition from the black, to the black uh, floating in that blackness to the white. And that white room, I was told I was there for healing, that whether I went back or whether I went on, we can't go to heaven with burdens and sadness and sickness. So I thought, okay, well, this is great. I like the white room. <laughs> and being an architectural historian, I looked around for lights, and there were no lights. It was just the walls were illuminated from within. And I saw a door at the other side of the room, and I decided, I don't know if I have feet or legs, but I'm going to perambulate toward that door. And it was almost as though, just with the intention, I started moving toward the door. And I knew what the door was. My whole life I've studied near-death experiences and read the books. And I knew the door meant that there was no coming back, that that was crossing the Rubicon. So I eagerly scooted toward the door at best possible speed because I was done. And I was so, again, just profoundly grateful. And at the door, I paused. Oh, I paused and I asked, is this the divine will for my life? That a simple slip of the surgical knife takes me out? And the answer was no. But the answer also was, but whatever you decide, if you decide to go forward or you decide to go back, whatever decision you make, you go with all of God's grace and mercy and blessings and love. There isn't a wrong decision. And that was immensely comforting because two and a half years prior to this event, my husband had come home for lunch one day and ended his life at our home. And I had been suffering from so many pains from that experience. Suicide survivors have burdens that most people can't imagine. But there have been so many difficult decisions to make, and one of my daily prayers was, God, I can't make any more decisions. These decisions all hurt so much and are so tough and all have such enormous consequences. So I felt like God had heard my prayers and saying, okay, you're not, you don't have to make a tough decision. There's, there's not a wrong decision here. And that meant the world to me. And my other daily prayer had been, either let me die in my sleep or heal me. But the pain occasioned by my husband's horrific suicide had cost me more grief and agony and suffering than I could ever enumerate with words. So I felt like those prayers had been answered too, that I had passed in relative peace and it was over. And my other prayer had been that I would not have a life review. Having gone through this once, I did not want to experience it again. And I did not have a life review. And I, it, it, it opened my eyes to how prayers of petition are also powerful, powerful prayers. So at that door, I was so grateful to hear that there wasn't a bad decision. There wasn't a wrong decision. So I reached for the doorknob, and I had a memory come to me of the nurse that had stood by my side when I was in that emergency room. She had held my hand as I was bleeding out before I lost consciousness, and she, I had exacted a promise from her that she wasn't going to let me die. And she said, oh, honey, we're not going to let you die. We have many solutions for this. 
So at that door, as I reached for that door to move on, to move through the door, that image of that nurse came to mind. And I had a vision of her. I saw her sitting on a stool in a hospital supply room with her head in her hands, literally just like this, sobbing uncontrollably and saying, I promised that woman I wasn't going to let her die, and I lost her. And especially after all the grief and pain I'd known for my husband's death, I thought, I don't think I can do that to somebody. I don't think I can inflict that much pain on somebody else. And, and I was still, still pondering, maybe I can. Maybe I can just go on and, because I need to go. I'm ready to go. And then I was, I, I, I felt her pain. I didn't just see it. I felt it internally. And it, uh, it swamped me. It was like somebody hit me in the chest with the, the pain. And I realized I could not do that. I, I felt her pain and it was so overwhelming and so painful. I realized I had to go back. So I literally, I had had my right hand on that door to push through and go on, and I literally put my right hand back at my side, still pretty interested by the fact that I was right-handed in heaven, but I thought, if I die, this is going to ruin her day. <laughs> Which seemed, she'd get over it, I realize now. <laughs> but in a millisecond of a millisecond, I was back on that gurney in the ER with a lot of activity happening all around me. And I was in the hospital for several days because I lost so much blood, my heart had stopped, which was very affirming. They told me the next day I had actually, my heart had stopped and they, um, I had a heart attack occasioned by the lack of blood. And there was an expectation that there'd be all kinds of serious um, after effects from this. The heart attack they believed had done significant damage to my heart and kidneys and liver and on and on and on. But I told them at every step of the way, the angel said, if I agreed to come back, I'd come back whole and healthy. <laughs> they, they did their test anyway, and all the tests affirmed that I had come back completely whole and without any lingering effects. And at the time of my death, I had been diagnosed with cervical cancer, which was at stage two because it already spread to nearby places. And when I came back from that, it took significant tests and some effort, but it was affirmed that every vestige of the disease was gone. I was completely healed. And while people love that, they love that story, to me the bigger healing was my soul. And shortly after that, I opened my Bible and, uh, when I was back home, and I opened it to Psalm 23. And it said, He restoreth my soul. And I, <laughs> I remember this so clearly. I was laying on the floor reading it, and I cried for about a half hour. And I realized, that's the real healing. While I'm very grateful to be disease-free, very grateful for a story that affirms the goodness of God, the power of love, the restorative power of such an experience. To have my soul healed was something that only God could do. The most remarkable healing was my soul. The, the sadness, the grief, the regret, the pain, the agony of losing my husband to suicide was gone. And what the angels told me was that it had been encapsulated, that it was there and it, it had caused a lot of pain, but it couldn't hurt me anymore. And I found that to be true. I was in the hospital for four days, and as soon as I got home from the hospital, I had these uh, mole traps all over my backyard. <laughs> and I, I'm, still, you know, I'm, I'm still pretty weak, fresh out of the hospital, and I went around the backyard and I kicked all the mole traps out because I thought these could hurt somebody. I just, <laughs> the idea of hurting a little mole it caused me great pain. And I subsequently uh, started selling off all of my personal possessions. As a writer, I had vast amounts of archival documents and materials and a massive private collection of historical ephemera of different types. I donated all of it to a college library. I started selling off my family's heirlooms, furniture that had been in the fam family for generations because I thought, you know, somebody else will enjoy this a lot. <laughs> And then I sold my car, and that's when my friends really thought I'd lost my mind. That was my dream car. I, I had special ordered it. it. took two months to get. But I drove it back to the dealership, had a friend take me, and I said, how much will you give me for this car? And they said, Mrs. Thornton, you, you spent two months waiting for that car. And I said, I know, I don't need it anymore. <laughs> After I'd sold my furniture, my possessions, and my car, I sold my home, listed it, sold within two hours. And then I left. I left. I was living in, uh, in the Virginia Beach area. And I left, I packed my clothes and some possessions in a slightly used Prius, which I had bought. And I drove a thousand miles due west to start a new life.
And that, that was also exactly what I needed. I, the old memories of where I had lived with my husband were dragging me to the depths of hell. And starting over was liberating. I, I cannot begin to describe what it felt like to be free of all those earth weights and to have a new chance at a new life. And so many people have said, oh, I wish I could do that. And yet, that's what's interesting is that's when my friends really thought I'd lost my mind is when I started selling off everything I owned and said I was going a thousand miles west. So that's, um, it's changed me in every way a human being can be changed and it's all for the good. And now life, everything looks so different. And I, I, I do cry more easily. When I hear about somebody who's lost somebody to suicide, I typically just burst out in tears because I feel their pain. And yet I don't, I don't go home crying and keep crying for days like I used to. I don't crawl into bed and stay there. So everything has gotten so much better. There are a lot of times, I guess the biggest struggle is I still think maybe I died and I've just gone to a new place because I'm not sure exactly what's happening. <laughs> I feel completely different. An interesting consequence of this, after I was out of the hospital, I realized that the arthritis that had plagued me in my wrist disappeared. Uh, I had a busted knee from an old injury that healed up. I had a busted shoulder from uh, an old injury. Pretty much I got, as a, my friend in IT says, you got rebooted by the Creator. <laughs> so it's, it's been an amazing experience. Every now and then somebody says, how do you know you really died? There's so many ways, but I guess the biggest would be when I died, I had been diagnosed with this life-threatening illness. When I came back, it had evaporated. I mean, there's, there's no medical explanation for any of that. And then my, uh, my blood work showed that I had a full recovery from hemorrhaging to death within 10 days. Within 10 days, all of my numbers on the blood work were back to normal, which the doctors told me would take about three months and it happened in 10 days. But again, the angels reassured me <laughs> everything would be reset. <laughs> and it was. Mm -hmm.